All right, I am going to start back up again. That's up to you. I'd probably rather listen to you anyway, so that... Wait, what? Did I just get slammed by the... No, not at all. I said they'd probably rather listen to you. That wasn't a slam. Oh, I thought you did. I, I'm no. Uh, I'm already, I've already produced the uh, lecture that we just did. Now I'm uploading it to, to YouTube, so that one will be out there by the time I leave today. The other one I'll, pro I'll try to get to tonight. I wanted to mention, this is the thing I mentioned before the break, and uh, it's kind of hard to read it from here, but I've got it over here too. Let's see. This eclipse tutorial.sourceforge.net. This is what I mentioned before. There's 17 lessons in here. It's actually very well done. It's a little bit dated. That's the bad news. And the other bad news is, again, the guy who does it, they, there's, a, there's banjo music throughout it. All right, so if you can get through that, you know, it's, it's not bad at all. Okay, so if you just go to Eclipse Tutorial. In fact, what I did, because I couldn't remember where it was, I just Googled Eclipse Tutorial Video, and it was the first or second one that came up. All right. Also, while on the break here, I looked and the nine best free HTML editors for web developers, okay? And there's a bunch of them, Phase 5, Programmer's Notebook, Synrite, Plain Edit, Notepad++, which you already have, JEdit. But a lot of people like using Sublime Text, all right? I just found out I'm using a new one called Adam. Yeah, there's, you're right. There's, they're, they're, the last time I heard, I mean, there was, there was an article I, I saved, but I've since thrown it out. They had the top 100. So there actually are one, at least 100 different ones. You know, and everybody's going to feel different about them. It's funny with Sublime Text because unless you change it by default, it's one of those where you've got the black background and the white writing. Some people like that better. Some people like that worse. So, And there's other ones. there. That's what it usually There it is. All right. And it's funny because it's under free. But I think it's free, but I think it, where, you know, it's, it's not totally free. It, they let you keep it for like a month, and that's one of those, if you want to keep using it, you've got to pay type yeah, of ideas. And Brackets is free. Brackets.io is another one. That, that should be on these machines. That was one I could remember before. All right. And some people like using that as an editor. All right. All right. I'm going to jump then back into, oh, that's done. I, uh, again, there's a couple of you who are not in the class this morning, so I just, because I'm trying to be consistent between them, that again, if you do go out to, to YouTube and you just search in there for Blackhawk Technical College, what I should do is just put the darn thing on my syllabi, but I always forget to. IT Web Software Developer, the name of the program, you get to my YouTube channel, all right? And as it says, it's right now it's at 777 videos. So there's a lot of stuff out there, all right? And the advantage of that is if, you're, if you want to go and look at some of the stuff that I put in there and you're not in that class, you can look at anything that's out there. I did some security training over, the, uh, over last semester at a company in Janesville. Those videos are out there. I put everything out there. Um, do, you have your, do you have them dated on there? They are dated. Uh, let's just put it this way. Most of them are dated, okay? All right. And uh, when I'm saving stuff this semester, because there's different channels in here too. And under the channels that I have, uh, uh, not there. Not, that's not it. But when you go in and you look at the channels, um, the, what I try to always do is I try to put them in there. So yeah, I'm not showing you what I want to show you. But in here, it's in here someplace. I know where it is, but I can, all right, it's under Video Manager. There it is. So I can go in here, and I can look in here under the, I think that's, that might be it under Channels. But someplace in here, all the different channels are listed, all right? And I tried to do it like it'll, it'll be called like 152, 167, and then in the parentheses, it'll say Spring 2016, and that's got all those, all right? I keep a master list, but I don't put that out there. I just keep it in a spreadsheet. So these are all the ones, again, that I've done so far, all right? Maybe it would be good knowledge to know. 
All right. So again, I don't plan on going over this. My hope is that again, at the end of chapter one, you can look at that and notice there's just a span. I thought it was a div, it's a span. So they put a span in there with click me on it and you run it and literally it looks like a paragraph basically when you bring it up. You add some CSS to it where they add a background color, a text color, etc., and now it looks like this. So the idea is it's supposed to look like a button from doing that, okay? Then they go in and they add the JavaScript. This is the key thing is what's in here. And I don't know if you get that or not get that, but to just keep it simple, it's a simple function that's called move it. And what they're doing is they're setting up the coordinates for their screen, and then they're setting up their X and their Y coordinates. And they're just coming up with random numbers. All right. So again, the idea is that click me thing comes up on the screen, and it's right around the middle of the screen. When you put your mouse on it, the button moves. And the idea is you're supposed to try to actually click it. All right, there have been a lot of games and stuff out there that people have put in the past that are very similar to that. All right, so what I don't like about what this author does, but I'm going to do it because it saves time, is what he's done in here is he's written what's known as obtrusive JavaScript. In other words, he's got his JS, his JavaScript files, his CSS, and his HTML in the same file. You are not allowed to do that. You are going to write unobtrusive JavaScript where you're going to put your CSS in its own file. You're going to put your JavaScript in its own file. You're going to put your HTML in its own file. And in the HTML file, you can then link to your CSS and you can link to your JavaScript. Why? Because that's the way it's supposed to be done. All right? Because otherwise, it just ends up being just a, a load of junk because there's just so much stuff and you get bloat. You get a lot of stuff in there that you probably don't even need. All right. At the end of every chapter in here, if you haven't seen this, it's very interesting. I don't know if you've ever looked at this or looked at the back, but uh, the guy who, who, who wrote this, the first guy, Brad Daly, the first author of your book, he's been in IT for 20 years. He's a programmer. He teaches. He does other. The other, the other author is his son, who's a student, who wrote it with him. All right, which is not all that common to see stuff like that. All right, but the, the only reason I'm bringing that up is this is their take. So when they say which is better, client side or server side script, and a lot of times when they ask questions like this, he'll give you the real nice political answer. Well, it depends. All right, but you know it's like reading anything. You know you can believe what you choose to believe on it. All right. There are exercises in here, and they do give you the answers to the exercises. They're in the book. All right. So you say, well, yeah, are you going to sign those? No, because they're in the book. All right. Chapter 2, which begins on page 35, as you can see in here, this is all about debugging. I'm not going to read any of that to you, but they talk about how you can use the debugger and there, there is a debugger. You might have heard of Firebug already, for example. And Firebug is the, basically, it's, it's the debugging editor that you can use with Firefox. IE's got a name for it, for its own. I don't remember what it, what it was. Opera's got one. But the, the one that they use for, if we're Chrome, is just called Chrome Developer Tools. So if I come in here and I bring up, this is a web page in here. If I go and on my keyboard, you've got those function keys at the top. If I hit the F12 key, all right, that's the Chrome Developer Tools in there. And that's what this chapter is about, is they talk about this. And the different tabs that are in there, all right? So I'll come back, back and forth between these as we go on. So I've shown you the first thing where they talk about it. And what they do in here, you may like this, you may not like this is typically when the author, especially in the earlier chapters, is trying to explain a concept to you, he will put a file in there and the file will have mistakes in it. Purposely, it will have mistakes in it. All right. Then he says, okay, so the idea is when you, when you, it says click me, when you click on it, what's supposed to happen is I think it comes back and it says you were clicked or something like that or it's got numbers, I don't remember. But the idea is they run it and then they're showing you in here, in the console, they're showing you two things. The first thing is 
this comes up and that's a message that they, you actually want to have come up that says page is loaded. And the other stuff that you see in here that's red is they're showing you there are errors in the code. And what the author is trying to show you is this console can be used for different things. So this here is your developer console. This is the console part of the console right there. But notice there's audits, there's, there's other stuff that you can use in here too. So as I just showed you, all right, there's elements, console, sources, network, timeline, etc. They all do different things. So if you look in there, all right, you can see when I click that, what comes up. If I click here, all right, you say, well, that doesn't show you much. It shows you a boatload of stuff because basically it shows you everything that's on the page and you can break it up any way you want to. All right. You can also come in with some of the stuff that's down in here. You can take a look at what event listeners are in here, what styles are currently being used. I don't know if, you've, if you went through this in your 157 class last semester. I have no idea if you ever talked about what's referred to as the box model. But they're showing you the box model right there. All this stuff is discussed in this chapter. I'm going to give you a high-level overview of it now. All right? Just so you know that the plan is I'm going to give you a high level overview of it now. Then on Wednesday, I'm going to go over chapter three. In an ideal world, we'll be done by four o'clock on Wednesday. Then the rest of the period, I want you to try to do some of the exercises that are in here. Not to turn in, but so you get some practice using some of the stuff that's discussed in the book. Because you've got basically like before and after types of pictures. All right. And the author does give you completed files in there too in uh, the source code that I mentioned to you before. I think personally, the less talking I have to do in here, the better off you are. Because you're going to learn a lot more by doing than you are by sitting here listening to me tell you how to do something. All right. All right, so he runs through it. If we just take a quick look in here, it should be pretty obvious what some of the errors are. First of all, okay, um, they spell function wrong. I was a professional developer for several years, and I will tell you that one of the first times I ever went to a code review for code that I wrote, I actually spelled function, but I spelled it F-U-C-T-I-O-N. And uh, would you believe it? There were 10 people there. Every one of them saw that. And they all asked me, of course, to start the meeting by pronouncing that. All right? But that's one of the errors. And it's an error anybody can make. The other one that's in here, when you look at it, notice what we're doing. We're calling, we're saying, when you click that span, call click it. Well, it's not called click it. So you can see the kind of errors that are in there. And the author wants you to walk through that, all right, and figure that out. And it does work. I've gone through the first, the exercises in the first six chapters, all right. So he shows you the errors that should come up. He talks to you about how you'd fix them. And then once you fix the first one, then it'll find the second one. Okay. Now, the, the reason last semester that I didn't spend a lot of time with the first year students, first semester students going over to Bugger, is you don't realize when you're in your first semester how little patience you have. You may or may not agree with that, but if I, if I turned the camera on you last semester, you'd notice how little bit of patience you have. I would watch people, you know, and I, you could, uh, something come out of their mouth that shouldn't. Or they'd walk out or they'd do whatever. But now you can take a step back, I think, and take a look at what's going on. And ideally, at least, it'll make a little bit more sense to you than it did last semester. Some people use these types of debuggers religiously, all right? And some people don't. But what it all comes back to, and I said it this morning, John's heard me say it multiple times, is you're always best off when you're developing. Write a little code and test it. Write a little more code, then test it. Keep writing your code incrementally like that. But if, you, if you're writing a 500-line program, don't write 500 lines and then start testing it. That is just stupid. All right? All right, then they start telling you some of the stuff that you can use in here. They give you another exercise. And this is kind of a neat exercise, I think. You may or may not agree. But the problem is, if you look at this, 
and it's very hard to see it with the picture that they've shown here, but there's problems in here. First of all, the word favorite, the word favorite should be italicized and nothing else should be. Well, if you look at it, everything's italicized. All right? Well, when I see that, the first thing I think of is you never closed it, right? And that's pretty much what they didn't do here. So everything that came after it is italicized. The other thing you can't tell from the picture that they have here is right here on that first unordered list item, there's no bullet. And that's because instead of making an LI, they accidentally put in LL. All right? And you might say, oh, I, I never do that. Everybody does something like that. All right? But the idea and the reason he has you do this is to show you, he's showing you in here what the problems are. So if you walk through this, all right, if you walk through this and you do the examples, you'll start to see what's going on. Why doesn't this work? Well, it'll make a lot more sense when you take a look at it in the guise of doing this. I've tried doing this in the past where we do this as a class. It's a cluster. It just doesn't work. Some people get it right away, and then other people don't. And the people who get it right away get nothing but perturbed at the people that it'll take a little bit more time for them to get it. That's why, like I said, the plan is to do, give you at least an hour on Wednesday where you're able to go through these examples on your own. All right? And I'll be here. John will be here if you have questions. All right, so you make the changes. Kind of hard to tell on there, but that is italicized now. All right? And the rest of it is not. Then they go through and have you make the other change. Same kind of thing. All right? And once you make the other change, okay, what they're trying to show you in here is if you look, notice there is LI, closing LI, LI, closing LI. And the idea is there, there's an LL. There's no closing LL because LL is not a tag. All right? That's what the author is trying to show you right there. Where it starts to really get... Mm -hmm is in here. Now, when you look, they're talking about the DOM editor. So what they say is, literally what you can do is you can come into the console right here, and it'll give you, over here, it'll basically give you a, uh, a prompt. And if you type window in there, you're going to get something that looks like this. It's going to show you all the different things that are, that are basically connected to the window. All right, so you can look at the different properties and stuff that are in here. And when you start to take a look in here, you all should know this already. When you get the arrows, it means if you click it, you can expand or contract it. All right. There it is, expanded. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff going on in there. And Denny hasn't told you this yet, and I don't know if he will or not, but as an example, when you start writing C sharp apps, all right, you might write you might create a button and 99 times out of 100, you're going to put the code in the button's click event. But that button has 30 or 40 other events that if you wanted to, you could put code in there too. All right. So there's a lot of stuff going on in here, but there's probably almost nothing for which you, you have any associated code. All right. Then he says, not only can you do that, you can come in and you can debug the CSS that's in here. And it's really cool because what you can do in here is you can make changes to the CSS and they immediately show on the web page. All right? So it's a, it's a chance for you to, you know, do, do like a little WYSIWYG, you know, what you see is what you get type of thing. And a lot of people like that. All right? With the layout editor, if you take your mouse and you put it over any element that's in here, it shows you this. So it shows you how much margin is set up for that element, how much border is set up for that element, how much padding is set up for that element. All right, you can see it visually, and again, you can manually come in here and change it. Some of the stuff you are manually able to go in and change, some of it you can't. Some of it you can change, but you've got to go back to your original source file and copy it into the source file for it to take effect. All right, so they show you the different things that you can do in here. I'm not going to read to you, but you can see the different stuff, and that's what I was trying to show you. So. Like I said, I literally went and, and looked at a lot of different books before I decided on this one. What I liked about this one is a lot of times it's the old, you know, what is it, teach a person to fish type of an idea as opposed to just throwing fish at you. All right. And that's what I liked about this. All right. He goes through another thing that's in here. 
just to show you. The idea is this right here is supposed to look like this right here. And the reason it looks wrong is what he did was he allotted 100 pixels per row, basically, in here. And each one of these is 70 pixels. So you can only put one in each one. All right? So the first thing he says is let's expand that out to 300. So he expands it out to 300, and it looks a little bit better. Then he says, but there's still too much padding, basically, in here. So then he tells you to go, to go in and change that, just so you can get some examples playing with the stuff. All right, I've, I've always said this. You know, the, the best way to learn this is to make yourself up a simple web page with a lot of different types of elements in it and just start throwing the kitchen sink at it to see what happens. All right, then finally he goes into the JavaScript stuff. All right, so notice there's different views and there's different things that you can have in here. The JavaScript view, that's where your actual code shows. You'll see that in just a second. There's a menu, so if you've got multiple files, you can click on any one and load whatever one into memory or onto the screen that you want to load in. Pause on exceptions. All right, what that says, if there's an exception which would otherwise make the program stop, Instead of stopping, it'll pause there. All right? Watch. This is probably the most powerful thing that's in here, the thing that says watch. And we'll look at the watch pane. It's on the next, down a little lower in just a second. But what you can do in there is you can put what's called a watch on any variable that's in your program. And as your program goes through, it'll show you its value. What's even cooler than that, if you say, well, gee, I wonder what would happen if I did this. You can go into the watch window and manually change the value, even while the program's running. Now, you've got to be careful when you do that. You can, it's very easy to break your program doing something like that. But sometimes you say, oh, I wonder what would happen if I did this. All right. The call stack, and you're going to see this in Java, too. Basically, it shows the progression of what function call, what function call, what function to get where you currently are. All right. You can set breakpoints. Literally, what happens is before, you, 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 literally, if I want to set a breakpoint, then here's my code. I literally click where the line numbers are. I can click on any one of those, and I think it turns red. It might be blue. I don't remember. But it puts a breakpoint there. So before that line of code actually executes, it stops. It literally breaks right there, so you can do whatever you want to do or have to do. So they show you the different things that are over here. There's a lot of different things that you can do with this. It's very similar in a lot of ways to what you'll learn from Denny for the C Sharp class. The ideas are the same. Most of the icons are going to look similar. They'll work the same, but they might, they might be positioned a little bit different, and they might actually look a little bit different. All right, so he comes in here, and there's an error in this code, even though it doesn't look like it. What happens is you're supposed to be able to come in here, and every time you click on a button or click something, it's supposed to add one to a counter. And it works fine. It comes in there, you click it the first time, it says one. You click it the second time, it says two. You click it again, and it says one. You say, what? The problem is what, what is happening in here is this variable, var count, that should be, these two lines should be flipped. Because if you create count up here, it's a global variable. But when you create it inside of the function, it gets recreated every time the function's called. So you're going to have a wrong value in there. It'll be right once or twice, and it'll be wrong the rest of the time. And he does that to show you the natural progression and exactly what's going on in there. This is it right here. Now, this he's putting a watch in here. All right? You go to, it also shows you, it says scope in here. So it lets you know which of your variables are local. And notice in here, it says count is local because it's declared inside of the function. If I move it outside there, it's going to be under the global. All right. And then he says, well, so how do you debug? How do you debug jQuery and how do you debug AngularJS? They're all JavaScript. So you debug them basically in the same way. All right? And the last thing that's in there, they talk about analyzing network traffic. This isn't going to be that big a thing for what we're doing in here. 
because again, we're using our same machine as both a client and a server. All right, but this is the kind of thing that if it was your site, you might want to look through it and say, geez, you know, this, this really, everything seems to be going really slow. You can do a lot of querying in here to find out if there are statements in your programs that are, are really taking a long time to execute. Maybe those are ones that you want to rewrite if you're trying to optimize the site. So they go through that in here. All right. And that's all I wanted to go through. All right. So next class, for next class, if you get a chance, take a, take a quick look at chapters one and two. If there's something you don't think I went over sufficiently, let me know. But I'm going to go over chapter three in the next class. It's not a real long chapter. And that will we'll hopefully do that in the first hour. Then in the second hour, I'd like you to try some of the exercises that are in here. The only thing I will tell you that I, I have not spent a lot of time on in this book, although I've done it in the past, is they've got a section in here where they create a lot of graphics. And when you create graphics, there's two ways of basically doing it in HTML5. You can use SVG, which are sc uh, scalar vector graphics, and you can use the canvas. And I didn't, I didn't use the stuff they did because I've done my own stuff in the past. All right. Last thing I'll tell you, because I am finished, but just so you know, again, because somebody had asked, I think Roger asked about this at the beginning, but some of the stuff that's in here that I put here, just so you know, these are things, these are older lectures that I've done in the past. So if you need a, a refresher on HTML or HTML5 or CSS, you might get something out of taking a look at what's in here. All right. That was a lot to throw at you in one period, but questions? That's all that I had.